City and county directories are among my favorite records for genealogical research. In addition to listing local inhabitants, city directories can provide a picture of the community where our ancestors lived. Like present-day white pages, these historical listings show the residents' names and addresses. They may also give occupation, employer, spouse's name, and sometimes even children's names. Many directories have information on cemeteries, newspapers, churches, schools, maps, and more. They can provide background material to help us see our ancestors in the context of their community. Watch this video to see the variety of information that is contained in city and county directories and to learn where you can find these value-packed volumes. This is the outline for today's presentation. First, I'll talk about what city and county directories are and give you some information on why and how they were created. I'll tell you what kinds of information you can find in those directories and give you some tips for getting the most out of the directories. Lastly, I'll tell you where you can find city and county directories for a variety of localities. City and county directories are first and foremost a listing of residents and or businesses in a particular locality. They were published by private companies, for example, Polk, Williams, and Wiggins and Weaver. And they were published for a profit. So they were private companies trying to make money by selling the directories and selling advertising in the directories. So as with any record used in genealogical research, it's important to know why and how the record was created. Data in the directories did not originate with any city, county, or federal government records. Information was gathered by door-to-door -door canvassing. Publishers hired individuals to traverse the locality to gather data on residents and businesses. Information in the directories is independent of city or county tax and voter rolls and independent of any state or federal census records. When analyzing the information found in directories, it's important to keep in mind that it is an independent source of information from these other records. City and county directories were published at somewhat regular intervals. Many publishers intended to publish them annually. Uh, they were not always successful in that endeavor, but they can be found for most years in most large cities. Here's a sampling of some of the directories that I found with the contemporary prices that were printed in the directories, as well as what they would sell for in today's dollars. So you can see that some of them were very, very expensive. So it's unclear that the normal day-to-day -day average citizen would purchase a directory. They were most likely sold to businesses, possibly libraries, or uh, they may have been of use to city governments. So city, and city directories were published in most large and medium-sized cities. In rural areas, there were sometimes county and farm directories, although they were by no means pervasive. Not every county had a directory. The oldest one I found was for Philadelphia in 1785, a year later in New York City. The oldest Cincinnati directory that I located was from 1819. And that was at the Public Library of Cincinnati in Hamilton County. And Ancestry.com has a Boston directory from 1823. So you can see that city directories were uh, around for quite a, quite a long time. Uh, they also fill in years in between censuses. So they're very helpful in tracking our ancestors through time. So what's in a directory? Well, obviously, there's a listing of the residents and their addresses. The historical directories also give us occupation, frequently place of employment. Sometimes they'll list family members 
and even give us an indication of relationships with other people. They also provide listings of businesses, giving us the address of the business and describing their products and services. Here's an example of a directory from Plainfield, New Jersey in 1909. I've selected Patrick S. Keeley here. We see that he's the chief of police and he works at police headquarters. Gives us his telephone number at work as well as his home address and his home telephone number. So uh, there's quite a lot of information here, certainly more than you would find in a current white pages directory. Some of the older directories may not be in strict alphabetical order. So here's an excerpt from the 1819 Cincinnati City Directory. We can see that all of the B's are grouped together but they're not in strict alphabetical order. So please be careful when looking at older directories uh, so that you don't overlook your ancestor. I've used the long series of Cincinnati directories available at the Public Library of Cincinnati in Hamilton County to track some of my ancestors over a 20 or 30 year period in the city. What I've done is to organize the data by entering it into a spreadsheet that allows me to sort and filter on certain criteria, for example, occupation or name. So I have tracked everyone with the last name of Berkla and a variety of different spelling variations uh, from 1850 to about 1885. So I have found my ancestor, Franz Xavier Berkla, in the 1850 census and the 1880 census. I've not yet located him in 1860 and 1870. But by gathering all of the data from various city directories and tracking him over this 35-year period of time, I can find that he is in the city. Apparently, I've just missed him, or possibly the census taker missed him in the censuses. But I'm fairly certain that he's there by tracking addresses and occupations and tying them to similar names, even if it's not exactly the same name. So city directories can give us hints as to relationships. Sometimes they're more than hints, sometimes they're explicitly stated. Here I've selected three people with the last name of Hardin. We notice that the one in the middle, Matilda, is the widow of Henry. So this gives us Matilda's husband's name and tells us that he has died sometime prior to 1859. We'll notice that the first and third person highlighted here are living at the same address. Thomas is at home, that's an H, at 826 French, while Lorenzo boards there. It's very likely that Lorenzo is Thomas's son and is boarding at his father's house. We'll also note that in 1859, it was acceptable to uh, list that Thomas and Lorenzo were colored. So an interesting commentary on uh, how people of color were designated in Delaware in 1859. Some other hints that can be found about relationships in city directories. Here I find my Frank X. Berkla, a wood turner. But in 1885, he's residing with John A. Hahn and living at a different address in a different part of town than where he had been previously. Uh, this gives me a hint that there may be some relationship between Frank and John. And it turns out that John was Frank's son-in-law. So look for these kinds of hints in city directories and track down these people um, that your ancestor may be living with. 
can also use city directories as an 1890 census substitute. So we're all frustrated by the fact that the census is missing. But here I found uh, Joanna, who's the widow of, of Jacob. Now Joanna is my great-great-grandmother. I found Joanna and Jacob living together in 1880. I found Joanna living with her daughters in 1900. So I didn't have a good idea of when Jacob had died or disappeared, but this city directory tells me that he is deceased prior to 1890. So that gives that cuts in half the interval during which I need to look for his death record. Businesses may be listed alphabetically, or sometimes there are classified business listings. So I've excerpted uh, the Buffalo City Directory from 1897 and given you a sample of some of the classifications of businesses of, available at that time. So we've got carriage and wagon makers, car works, uh, those cars refer to railroad cars, not to automobiles in 1897. So you can look up to see uh, if your ancestor is listed here or possibly your ancestor's employer would be listed. Some city directories are organized geographically. Most are alphabetical, but some are geographic. Uh, sometimes they're called householders directories. And sometimes they'll be in the back of the book after the alphabetical listing, so make sure that you look for them. But these will list residents in order of their street address. So it'll give you a good idea of who's in the neighborhood. Uh, Denver has several householder directories from the 1920s and 1930s. These are housed at the Denver Public Library. In Denver, 1934, I looked at East 8th Avenue. And you can see um, houses are listed house by house with the individual owners or tenants. Uh, the cross streets are also listed. So focusing in on the 400 block, we see that on East 8th Avenue between Logan and Penn, we have only one house. It's 400 East 8th Avenue. It's occupied by Claude and Edna Betcher prominent citizens of Denver at that time. The star after Edna's name indicates that they are the owners of the property. And this is the president, the present day governor's mansion in Denver. So what else is in a directory? Well, certainly a lot of information about the locality. Sometimes there'll be a renaming or a renumbering of streets documented. Very useful information. Description of the city wards. So if you find in a census that your ancestor is, is an occupant of ward number three, you can find out information about that. Uh, sometimes we can find maps in city directories city and government officials, courts, judges, and justices of the peace, and current newspapers. Here we see an example of street renaming. So the 1918 directory of Cincinnati tells us that Bremen has been renamed to be Republic. Bremen was changed to Republic because of anti-German sentiment during World War I. So a family may appear to have moved between 1910 and 1920. They may not have actually moved. Uh, possibly the street name was changed instead. Sometimes uh, houses were renumbered. In 1865, the city directory tells us that there was a a lot of renumbering going on and gives us old and, and new numbers. So house by house, 
street by street gives us the old number, old house number, and the new house number. So again, your folks may not have moved. It could be that their address has simply changed. I mentioned uh, descriptions of the city ward. So here we have the uh, city of Louis Louisville, Kentucky in 1866 to 67. And it describes each ward. So the third ward is between Shelby and Hancock streets and from the river south to the city limits. Detroit went a step further and, and did a, a mini census of each of their wards. Um, you'll see that they've, uh, ward by ward, they've given us the number of males and females under 21 and over 21, and they have enumerated the, or counted the colored inhabitants of the city separately. Cincinnati's city directory in 1843 contains a wonderful map of the city and indicates each ward in the city. So this is what Cincinnati looked like in 1843. Directories can also give us listings of this, the city or county government officials at that time. So here we have the Board of Aldermen and the Board of Delegates from St. Louis in 1857. City directories often list the local courts. So here we have St. Louis County Courts from 1857. We see that there is a separate land court. So this is great information. If we're looking for land records, we know to look in the land court and not in the simple county court or one of the other courts. Justices of the peace are often listed as well. Here we have the Richmond, Indiana City Directory for 1886 to 87, and it lists the justices of the peace by township. This may help us to decipher a scribbled JP's signature on a marriage record sometime. So good information to have. Contemporary newspapers are often listed in city directories. So here we have a listing from the 1870 Atlanta directory. You'll note that the first newspaper listed there is the Atlanta Constitution. That newspaper d survives to present day and is the big newspaper in Atlanta today. But there are six other newspapers listed, six or seven other newspapers listed. This would give you a list of newspapers to go research if you were looking for information from this time period. So what else is in a directory? Well, there are street guides, lists of churches and schools, cemeteries, organizations, information on transportation, advertisements, and sometimes even marriages and deaths. Here is an example of a street guide from a Wheeling, West Virginia directory from 1871-72. We see here that Fourth Avenue runs from Madison to Wheeling Creek east of Market. So if you find an address for your ancestor, but you have no idea where that street is in the city, this will help you see where that street was at that particular time. It may not be the same as it is today. Churches were also listed in city directories. So you, this may give you hints as to where your ancestors may have worshiped. You may know what faith community they belong to, or you may not. Frequently, you can find the address of the church, and you can see which churches are close to where your ancestors lived. 
Likewise, schools are listed. Here we have a listing of the members of the Board of Education and possibly your ancestors were among them. Uh, but I think here it's important to note that in Cleveland in 1870, there were actually two high schools. So if you're looking for high school records from this time period, you have to look at West High School as well as Central High School. So that may be important to know. City directories also list the contemporary cemeteries. So if you need to find where your ancestors are buried, this will give you a list of cemeteries that existed at that particular time. So this is St. Louis from 1865. You see the cemeteries that existed and what they were called. So they may have been renamed since then, uh, but this will give you a great starting, starting place to look for burial locations for your ancestors. City directories oftentimes list organizations as well. Trade unions, fraternal organizations, church societies, and so-called secret societies. Uh, these may include Mason Masonic Lodges, the International Order of Odd Fellows, the American Protestant Association, Improved Order of Redmen, Sons of Temperance, Daughters of Temperance, Templars of Honor. This will at least give you a list of possible organizations to research to see if your ancestors belong to any of them. Transportation information can also be found in city directories. This is from the Kansas City Business Directory and Mirror of 1865 to 66. And they describe the Santa Fe stage line. Gives us the name of the agent and the secretary tells us that their offices are located in the bank building on Main Street. The stage runs once a week from Kansas City to Santa Fe, New Mexico and Denver, Colorado. It takes 15 days and covers 841 miles. Leaves Kansas City every Friday morning at eight o'clock. So this is great information to tell you, you know, if your ancestors made that journey from Kansas City in this time period, how long did it take? When could, you know, when could they possibly leave? If it only ran once a week. Here's a railroad map that I found in the Atlanta directory for 1870. Uh, it's, little bit difficult to read, but it is downloadable to your computer where you're able to zoom in and see some detail here. But this gives you an idea of what options your ancestors may have had for railroad travel in approximately 1870. The city directories also sold advertising to help offset their costs and hopefully to contribute to their profit. Here I found an advertisement for the Chatfield and Woods Company in a Cincinnati directory. This particular advertisement was important to me because my grandfather worked at Chatfield and Woods in this time period. So I can see the address of, of their office. They're on third between Plum and Pearl Streets. I can cross-reference this with where my grandfather was living at the time and see how far he had to travel every day to get to his job. I can see what kinds of products this company produced. So this, this gives me some really good detailed information about my grandfather. So look up uh, the businesses where your ancestors worked. See if you can find advertisements for those concerns. Also, the advertisements give us an idea of what life was like for our ancestors. So here's an advertisement for the John Van Range Company from a 1919 directory, and we can see what the state-of-the-art gas range looked like at that time. 
complete equipment for the home kitchen. And it describes certain things that they sell, aluminum ware, Pyrex glassware, cast iron cooking utensils. So a lot of the same things that we use today were available to our ancestors in 1919. I mentioned marriages. So the New London, Connecticut directory in 1892 listed all of the marriages that it had occurred in a one-year period prior to the publication of that city directory. This is unusual, but look for these things because you will find hidden gems in some of these city directories. They also uh, listed all of the deaths that occurred the previous year. So look, you know, look through the directory to find all these hidden gems. In the rural areas, we had county and farm directories. They're relatively rare. Not every county produced them. But where you can find them, they provide a lot of valuable information about the community. There was a directory produced for Henry County covering the period 1916 to 1921. So not all directories were annual. This one uh, was intended to cover a five-year period. But it describes uh, Henry County uh, with its over 3,000 farms in the area. More than 96% of the entire area of the county was in farms. More than 85% under cultivation. The farms are described as more than average size. Kind of sounds like Lake Wobegon. Uh, less than 3% being under 10 acres. They're almost without exception profitable and correspondingly valuable. The farmers are the most prosperous folks in the county. So this tells us a lot about Henry County farming in the early 20th century. So farmers are relatively prosperous and well thought of and sounds like you know, farming is really doing well at that time. The directory also contains a picture of the downtown area of Napoleon, Ohio, the county seat. Looking at the entries in the directory, we see that uh, they give us a lot of information. They tell us which telephone company um, each subscriber was using. They tell us how many children are in the house. They tell us whether the resident owns or rents, uh, the rural route that they're on. It tells us the number of horses and the number of cattle that each person has. So quite a bit of information here, certainly more than you would expect in a simple directory. Clayton County, Iowa in 1914 had a wonderful directory that gave township plat maps. So let's look inside this one. Here we see the Farmer's Directory of Elk Township in Clayton County. And we'll focus in on one, one of the residents, J.G. Brokemeyer. He's on Rural Route 1. He has 130 acres in Section 21 and 30 acres in Section 22. His wife is Mariah, and he has children Benny, Clarence, and Ernie. And Mr. Brokemeyer has lived in the county for 25 years. So an incredible amount of information here in a simple county directory. But there's more. If we go back in the directory, we can see each township is um, laid out in a plat map focusing in on the sections where Mr. Brokemeyer had his land. We see that uh, sections 21 and 22, there's John Brokemeyer. It shows 50 acres in section 21 and 30 acres in section 22, but an adjacent 51 acres uh, down in section 28. So that makes up his approximate 160 acres of land. 
So some tips for getting the most out of city directories. My first tip is to read and understand all of the abbreviations that are used in the directory. Certainly publishers were interested in, in keeping down their uh, publication costs. They wanted to squeeze the maximum amount of information into the minimum amount of space. So they used a lot of abbreviations. Make sure you find the key and read and understand all of those abbreviations so that you know what, what you're looking at. Read the table of contents. This is a table of contents from a Biloxi, Mississippi directory in 1936. The arrows point to an alphabetical directory, a business directory, a crisscross telephone directory, and a householder's directory. So the alphabetical list is residential, and we've talked about business directories certainly. The crisscross telephone directory is interesting. Uh, it lists the telephone numbers in numerical order and then the subscriber for each number. Now, unfortunately, this is a 1936 directory and it is clearly marked with copyright. So I did not um, extract that and show you, but you can imagine uh, a list of telephone numbers in numerical order and next to each number is the subscriber that had that number. Interesting information and difficult to obtain that sort of thing today. Read the preface in the directory if one is available. So the preface can oftentimes give social context of the area at that time. They'll talk about significant recent events, including new construction projects, immigration and demographic information. Uh, sometimes the editors seem defensive regarding the price of the directories and the accuracy of the information they contain. So it gives you some insight into um, their motivation for producing the directories, which we know is it's part of their business. They were looking to make money selling directories, and they struggled to get complete and accurate information. Uh, the Cleveland Directory from 1837 and 38 gives a very long history of the city and also lists a large, about a one-page table that I've extracted here. Um, giving the names of the original owners of lots in the city of Cleveland. So fantastic historical information that you may not have expected to find and information that actually predates the publication of the directory by uh, several years. The preface for the Cincinnati Directory and Business Advertiser 1849 to 50 contains a statement by the publisher of how difficult it is to gather correct, correct and accurate information for the city. Uh, they complain that citizens seem to be annoyed by their solicitors and don't appreciate the importance of correctness in collect, the collection of materials. Consequently, when called upon for the information, they give it as briefly as possible and frequently become irritated when more particularly questioned. From this arises many erroneous statements and many entire omissions. They go on to complain that in very many cases, the information must be had from females in the household. And our canvassers have very often found that the wife did not know the business of her husband and frequently that she could not even give his name correctly. Parenthetically, they advise every man to let his wife know his business and learn her how to spell his name. Oftentimes, information is necessarily obtained from workmen and boys in manufacturing shops and from domestics and families, few of whom are able to give it correctly. So this gives us real insight into opinions held about women and about certain working class people in the mid-1850s. 
So very interesting social statements here. In Cincinnati in 1914, there's a very extensive preface that talks a lot about the goings on in the, the city in the previous year. Uh, there was an interesting section on new liquor license laws. Um, apparently there was a, a new constitution in the state uh, that specified that there shall not be more than one saloon to 500 inhabitants in any political subdivision of the state. As a result, over 500 saloons were closed in Cincinnati and only 802 licenses were granted. They go on to state that the Sunday closing law for the first time is now being observed in Cincinnati. And it wasn't due to any activity for, on the part of state and local officials, but on the provision in the law that would cause saloon owners to lose their license if they violated the law in any way. So now that licenses were few and far between and hard to get, um, people were more observant of the law. The law did have a couple of other unintended consequences, though. We see that um, by closing the saloons on Sunday, it greatly increased the revenues of the streetcar companies operating between Cincinnati and, and Covington, Newport, and other cities across the Ohio River in Kentucky, where saloons were allowed to be open on Sundays. It also caused in the new industry of bootlegging to spring up in Cincinnati. So an interesting uh, commentary on laws at the time and some of their unintended consequences. The same 19 page preface to the 1914 directory describes the general business depression in the area at the time, the growing need for passenger and freight train terminals, labor troubles, including strikes by Teamsters, workers in laundries, garment factories, cigar factories, shoe factories, and even the musicians union. It went on to describe the elimination of the old and dangerous buildings at the request of the fire marshal. New buildings completed in the year included the Gibson House, the Gwynn Store, a new office building at 6th and Main, and the new home of the Cincinnati and Suburban Bell Telephone Company at 4th and Hammond Streets. Improvements to city parks, sewer and water systems, elimination of railroad grade crossings are also documented in this preface. So where you can find them, please do read the preface. It will give you a lot of good information on what's going on in that locality at that particular time. So where do you find these wonderful city directories? Well, fortunately, a lot of them are available online today. Miriam Robbins has gathered um, a listing of United States online historical directories, and she's organized them by state. So you can go to her website that is in the show notes below and go to the state of interest for you and see what directories are available. Uh, so here I've selected Colorado, and you can pick a particular county. So here's a partial list of the directories that she has listed for uh, county of, of Denver. City and county directories are also available uh, from Ancestry.com. This is a subscription site, but it is available for free at many local libraries. So to find city directories on Ancestry.com, under search, look at the card catalog, then filter the collection by schools, directories, and church histories. Further filter by city and area directories, and then by location and you should get a list of city and county directories for that area. City directories can also be accessed through Heritage Quest, which is available from many local libraries. Here I show how to access it from the Denver Public Library. Go to their databases A to Z, 
and look under H for Heritage Quest and then click on City Directories and you'll get a Family History Books and Directories search page and from here you can search for your ancestors. Cindy's List also has a listing of city directories so you can click under locality specific. She has directories for Canada, for the United Kingdom and Ireland, for the United States, and some uh, listed on, under miscellaneous as well. I would also recommend that you look at her general resources for information about city directories. It's very helpful. Linkpendium will also give you a listing of city directories by locality. So here I've gone to the Linkpendium homepage and clicked on USA, Ohio, and Franklin County. And we can see uh, Linkpendium lists these directories for Franklin County and Columbus. Libraries may have books ebooks or microfilm containing city directories and similar volumes. Look at the online catalog at the directory. Make sure to check out the library's digital collection and make sure to look at both public and university libraries in the area where your ancestor lived. The Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County has a wonderful collection of, of city directories starting in 1819. Uh, here's the URL. It's also listed in the show notes below. Uh, they have PDF versions of the directory so that you're able to download them to your computer. Uh, their searching is, and browsing is much faster after you've downloaded the entire directory to your computer. Uh, than it is to look online. So I'd, recom I'd recommend downloading the directories where you can. Uh, Denver Public Library has Denver City directories starting in 1873, arranged by name and resident or business name. Um, they also list the occupations of, of the residents. They have householders directories uh, starting in 1924. Uh, these directories, as I've mentioned, are arranged by address, and they show owners, residents, and businesses' names. The URL for the Denver Digital Collection is included in the show notes as well. Denver Public Library also has actual historical city directories. It's a well-used and well-loved collection, as you can see. The Library of Congress has probably the most extensive collection of U.S. city directories. It's on microfilm, microfiche, and paper. Unfortunately, the directories are only viewable in Washington, D.C. Library of Congress also has an extensive collection of U.S. telephone directories. So these are more modern day directories. From 1976 to 1995, they're on microfiche for most U.S. cities and towns. Before 1976, they have uh, directories from 14 states and Washington, D.C. on microfilm. They have New York City directories starting in 1878. Uh, so if you're looking for uh, telephone directories and more modern day information, this would be a, an excellent source. Remember to look at state archives. They will often have digitized city and county directories. So here's a, an excerpt from the Maryland State Archives webpage uh, showing part of their collection of city and county directories. Fold 3 has city and county directories in their non-military collection. So go under non-military and select city directories. From there you can choose a state. Make sure to scroll to the bottom of the list of states. After you've exhausted the list of states, scroll down to the bottom. 
You'll see there are miscellaneous directories and further states listed. I don't know why it's organized this way, but make sure to, to scroll and look at this at the miscellaneous city directories as well so you don't miss anything that they may have. Online city directories can also be found on Google Books, Internet Archive, and Hathi Trust. What you would do is go to one of those uh, URLs and search for city directory, county directory, or farm directory. And make sure to type in the locality that you're interested in. Many of these books can be downloaded to your computer in PDF form. I've also looked for city directories in uh, a search engine, so Google, Bing, Yahoo, etc. Again, use search terms of the location that you're interested in. The word historic is important, otherwise you'll get a lot of uh, current day information. And look for the words city directory, farm directory, or county directory. So here I searched for Clayton County, Iowa, Historic Farm Directory, and that wonderful directory that I showed you came up as the first result. So in summary, uh, we've talked about what are city and county directories and why and how were they created. We've talked about all the wonderful kinds of information you can find in city directories and some tips for getting the most out of the directories. And I've uh, shown you where you can find these directories. I hope you found the information in this video to be useful and that you will seek out the valuable insight that directories can provide to you about your ancestors' communities. If you have questions or comments, please leave them in the section below and I will respond to them promptly. This has been City and County Directories, Windows to Your Ancestors Community, presented by Beth Benko. Thank you.